Hey folks, welcome back to our recorded lectures for HI-121. This is Amarna Sunrise, The Many Faces of Akhenaten. So instead of beginning with questions for this lecture, I actually want to give you a quote. This is from an article in History Today by the author John Ray. And he says, Akhenaten as we have him is essentially the creation of post-Freudian man. The ingredients are rich. A tormented visionary, a misunderstood poet, a visual artist of genius whose mission went unheeded, the apostle of domestic virtue, an incestuous child abuser, a political disaster, an insane bisexual pope or ayatollah suffering from pathological endocrine disorder, a man out of his time. All that remains is to select some of those, stir and season with political, psychological and religious bias to taste. That's quite the quote. Think about what he's saying here. What he is saying about Akhenaten, who is perhaps one of the most mysterious of our Egyptian pharaohs, is that how we see him is incredibly diverse, and it depends very much on your perspective. This is true of any history, of course. But Akhenaten is a particularly interesting case of this, and I'm hoping over the next half hour or so that I'm able to uh, explain why. So a little bit of background, first of all. So we know relatively little about Akhenaten, even by the standards of Egyptian pharaohs. Uh, it's a late discovery by the standards of Egyptology. Uh, we know that Jean-Francois Champollion stopped briefly at Tel El Amarna, which is one of the major sites. There had been very little work done at that point. And he made a few notes about the depiction of the king on some of the boundary stelae. He says, king very fat and swollen, big belly, feminine contours, considerable softness. So even Champollion was noticing something just a little bit unusual about the way in which Akhenaten was portrayed. Now, in his later summary of Egyptian history, mind you, he skips over this period. He calls Ak Akhenaten Horus. He has no real knowledge about who he was, just some impressions that the art was odd. Now, by the middle of the 19th century, uh, a German scholar, Lepsius, uh, comes with an expedition and focuses mostly on the tombs. And he determines that the king is not, in fact, female, which is actually a switch from current portrayal at the time. Akhenaten is depicted as a woman in historical works for a number of years in the first half of the 19th century. But Lepsius digs up some more information about his religious reforms and talks about how he established a cult of the sun and destroyed the previous cult of a moon. Uh, but that the next pharaoh, of course, reverted. Now, he was curious as to why this would have happened in the first place and started pointing to influence from Nubia and Western Asia. So after Lepsius is when we first start to see scholars looking at Akhenaten's period as something worth looking at in its own right, as something interesting. So the British Egyptologists, like uh, William Flinders Petrie, praise him as a monotheist. Uh, actually, some of the American scholars went even further and talked about how uh, Akhenaten got rid of, uh, well, one of them says it's the Ammonite papacy. So there's almost like a Protestant take on monotheism. Uh, they praise Akhenaten's religion as being closer to modern scientific ideas. Now, the kind of creepy thing is that some of the English scholars also write about him saying that he has a mixed heritage uh, because his mother is uh, possibly Mitanni from Western Asia. He's seen as part white. So this is why he's able to make such sweeping changes. Yeah, these are Victorians. You, you have to expect this type of thing from them. Now... German scholars take a completely different view. Akhenaten's religion is depicted as alien, you know, the fault of his foreign mother. Uh, his weird artistic depictions are seen as indicating non-white traits that are foreign and feminine and unhealthy, whereas the native Egyptian culture, the Germans argue, is masculine, powerful, and healthy. Now, this goes some scary places in the Nazi period, uh, Akhenaten is defined as a threat to ancient Egyptian communal culture, which the Nazi scholars believed had a collective spirit of its own. 
So Akhenaten threatened this, he disrupted this, and it was all because of his foreign blood, which also was reflected in what they saw as his deformity, which, you know, is not as straightforward as it seems. Now, the French, meanwhile, were anti-clerical, so their fin de siècle movement was revolting against rationalism, uh, opting for symbolism and expressionism instead. They liked Akhenaten's art, and they thought his religion was humanistic. So this is just my way of indicating to you uh, how much our take on Akhenaten was shaped in the early days by who we are and what's going on around us. Well, let's talk about the pharaoh himself for a little bit. So he was actually born Amenhotep uh, in the 14th century BCE. He was a younger son of Amenhotep III. Uh, Amenhotep III and his family were almost like the film stars of Egypt in a way. His parents get a lot of attention, Akhenaten's parents. Uh, uh, Amenhotep III is often paralleled to Louis XIV of France, uh, the Sun King. He had a long reign, a very luxurious court, apparently very personally decadent. And his mother, Tai, was depicted as sort of Cinderella, which is not really the case. She was more of the, probably of the local aristocracy. And we don't even know for sure that she wasn't related to the royal family. Now, her mother um, had some sort of religious position, we know. And some early writers pointed to Tai as the source of uh, her son's religious ideas because it was possible she wasn't fully Egyptian. As I said, there have been some arguments that she was, in fact, at least part Mitanni, which is uh, modern-day Armenia, actually. Now, our first uh, record of Akhenaten is from an inscription on a jar that uh, held food for his father's festival. Um, the festival is called the Sed Festival. It happens in the 30th year of their reign. We think he succeeded his father directly. Now, there were actually some temple building programs in honor of the Aten that began very early on in Akhenaten's reign, maybe even in the first year. There's a temple complex called the Gempa Aten, uh, that if the Aten who has found, or he who has found the Aten. Uh, this is built not far from Karnak, so it's at one of the major ritual sites. Now, Akhenaten is depicted as having both male and female physical characteristics. And this has given scholars fits for many years. People keep trying to see it as saying something about his sexual orientation or biology. And that may not actually be the case. Now, he does appear on some of the relief structures with a consort who is perhaps even more famous than he is, and that's uh, Nefertiti. Uh, Egyptian female names that end with Edi, by the way, are usually related to goddesses, while Nefer has association with beauty and completeness. And uh, some of the scenes from uh, relief carvings from this era show her about to get into bed with her husband. They did have a number of children, six daughters that we know of. And uh, she has a very striking piece of art. It's very, very well known. You may have probably have seen pictures of the bust of Nefertiti before. So it is made of limestone. It is covered with painted stucco layers. It was discovered at Amarna in a sculptor's workshop by German scholars in 1912. It's in very good shape, all things considered. Uh, one eye has an uh, inserted piece of quartz to represent the iris. The left eye doesn't. Uh, it might have been left unfinished deliberately. Now, what's really interesting is that in 2006, a CT scan of the statue showed a face below the face, and it was like a wrinkled, aged version of Nefertiti's face. And they went looking because under different lighting, they noticed there were hints of wrinkles and hints of under-eye bags. So it's interesting to think of what that perhaps meant, why they would have gone to the trouble of creating an older face under the younger face. The bust is in Berlin. Uh, it is a major marketing draw for the city. It was shipped to Berlin the year after it was found. And you might notice I use the term displaced. That's a euphemism. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very, very dicey, really. Uh, we know that it was hidden in a salt mine during World War II to prevent it from uh, being 
spirited away, was found by the Monuments Men and returned to West Berlin. It's been a huge point of controversy since it was first unveiled. Uh, recently, Egyptian scholars have been pushing very hard to have it repatriated. Zahi Hawass, who is the very controversial head of the Egyptian uh, Supreme Council of Antiquities, threatened in 2007 to ban all Egyptian artifacts from being displayed in Germany unless they sent her back. And the question, of course, is was the export of this legal, which is very questionable. Uh, there have been accusations that the German archaeologists in the 19-teens concealed the bust's real value. They took a deliberately poor picture. They didn't let the Egyptian inspector actually see the bust himself. Now, the original documents for the export were revealed in 2009. Uh, the bust was described as uh, the painted plaster bust of a princess. Now, in 2003, the bust was actually placed atop a, a female bronze statue uh, as part of an art installation called the Body of Nefertiti. Uh, and it was the artist's impression of what she would have looked like. The artist was trying to show how relevant ancient art really is still to our aesthetic sense, but Egyptian cultural officials just went berserk because, you know, they, they did not like this singular piece of cultural heritage being reused like that. Now, the bust has become an enormously significant cultural object for the Germans. It's associated with their national identity, probably in, a way, in an attempt to outdo the English with uh, Tutankhamun. I personally think they should send it all back, but, uh, you know, that's not necessarily an unpopular opinion these days. When you look at uh, some of the stuff I talked about in the Egyptology lecture, a lot of this stuff should never have left Egypt in the first place. Colonialism has a lot to answer for. All right, about four years into his reign, uh, Akhenaten decided to move his capital from Thebes to Amarna, uh, which is called Akhet Aten in ancient Egyptian. And we know this because of Boundary Stella K, which is a uh, Stella found at the south end of Amarna. It's depicted uh, with images of the royal family dating to 1348 BCE and includes a speech from the pharaoh about why the capital was moved. Uh, there are political reasons at work that we don't necessarily understand. Uh, now, he does place part of the blame on the priesthood of Amun for resisting his religious reforms. Uh, there's so other suggestions that perhaps the... Uh, priesthood of Amun had just gotten too powerful, and Akhenaten's religious reform was about trying to break that power down. Uh, it doesn't seem entirely likely, to be honest. Uh, most priests are royal appointees at this point in Egyptian history. The pharaoh probably controlled most of the wealth of the temples. Now, it's a strange choice of site for a city. It's not particularly well situated doesn't have uh, good access to water, but it has appropriate geology for religious purposes. East of Amarna, you can see the sun rising through a break in the cliffs, so the sunrise could be red. Uh, Amarna is basically the antithesis of Thebes. It's new, it's free of any other associations. It's kind of like how uh, Constantine the Great moved the capital to Constantinople because he wanted an entirely new Christian city. He didn't want all the pagan associations of Rome. Similar sort of thing with Akhenaten and Amarna. Now, the archaeological excavation at Amarna began around the end of the 19th century, continued until 1935, Modern excavation begins in 79. Now, it was oriented towards the course of the Nile. Uh, there were a few large monumental buildings, the Great Palace, the Great and Small Temples to the Aten. There are tombs in the eastern mountain cut into the rock. It's sort of like the beginning of his own Valley of the Kings. An interesting variety of architecture, really. Uh, one of the other buildings in Amarna that's worth noting is uh, the North Palace, which was made of uh, mud brick, and which would have had very high walls. Uh, uh, there's some interesting decoration. Uh, there are famous famous room called the Green Room that shows birds in the swamp. It's one of the most uh, well-known examples of Egyptian art. 
The courtyards were probably filled with plants, maybe pools of water. The North Palace might have been for the Queen and her household. Now, there is no sign of planning in the suburban areas, probably because of the relatively short lifespan of the city. Uh, moving in sufficient people to build it, to run it, would have happened very quickly. And there was no clear division between industrial, domestic, and ritual space. Even if Akhenaten's uh, form of government and religion had survived for more than just the single generation, I, it doesn't really seem likely that Amarna would have. It just was not well situated at all. Okay, so Amarna art. It's much more realistic than Egyptian art uh, of the period, much more naturalistic. It may have been designed to shock uh, contemporaries. You know, things like Akhenaten's androgynous statues may also have had messages sort of embedded in them about uh, his role as the god, mother, and father of mankind. Uh, you don't see as many traditional scenes in Amarna art. You know, it is very different. And the children look like aliens. There's just not another way to put it. But think about it, though. They're also depicting the parents being parents. You know, there's something very warm and familial about all of this. You see the daughters taking part in religious rituals along with their parents. And you also get uh, images of everyday life. So here, for instance, are some uh, scribes working. So you see a lot of uh, different depictions of ordinary people. A lot of uh, depictions of police, uh, such as they were in this period, too. Some people interpret that to mean that this was an over-police state, but I don't know about that. There's only so much you can draw from what is or is not depicted in art. There is one that I couldn't find an image of, of Akhenaten and Nefertiti weeping at the bedside of their dead daughter in the tomb. They are often depicted as kissing in public. Now, Otten the Otten is not depicted. This may have had theological reasons. Uh, there is uh, an inscription from Karnak where Akhenaten is recorded as having condemned, being condemning graven images, sorry, where he's recorded as condemning graven images. <laughs> so he didn't believe you should be trying to depict the Aten. You cannot create one's creator. It's sort of like an early take on iconoclasm. All right, so here is uh, one of the statues of Akhenaten that really shows you the, the oddness of how he's depicted and some of the feminine characteristics. Now, it really is an unusual depiction. You know, is it a reflection of reality or is it symbolic? Is our artists from this period trying to depict him as androgynous in an effort to draw associations with the Otten as sort of the uh, all gender and genderless father and mother of mankind? Was it just exaggerated in an effort to challenge orthodoxy in art and religion? Now, if it's a faithful depiction, if Akhenaten actually looked like this, what does this tell us about him and his medical status? And there have been so many uh, words written on what kind of medical issues he might have had that would have produced this sort of physical appearance. So Froelich syndrome, for instance, uh, as a disorder of the pituitary gland, and uh, adult males with this disorder often uh, display what might be called effeminate traits. And, you know, it wouldn't explain all of Akhenaten's odd traits in art. You know, his strange-shaped head, his long neck. You know, plus he's the leader of a sun-worshipping cult whose rituals all took place in the sun in Egypt. And people suffering from Froelich syndrome had, had difficulty uh, regulating their body temperature. He would have fried. Plus, you know... The other thing with Froelich syndrome is that usually it involves severe intellectual disabilities. How is he capable of doing everything that he did in that case? Now, Marfan syndrome also gets raised as a possibility. It's a disorder of the connective tissues. This is what they think Lincoln had, by the way. 
And so sufferers of Marfan syndrome have long limbs, sort of spider-like fingers and toes, a strangely shaped test, uh, chest, hyperextensible joints, other traits that we see in Akhenaten's images from Amarna. Now, it uh, is also associated with myopia, nearsightedness. So is, is that why um, Akhenaten loved light? Is that why he's frequently depicted as holding the hand of Nefertiti or one of his daughters? Did he need help to get around? But it doesn't match the deformities of the head or the feminine attributes. Now, a very recent guest is a, a genetic disorder called Kleinfelter syndrome, where there are extra X chromosomes, so it produces a tall and androgynous appearance. Now, the only problem with that is that it also uh, causes infertility in most cases. And again, he had six daughters. So should we take the art literally? That's a really good question. I, I tend to lean towards no. Like, why should we take art literally? I, I don't think the default should be assuming that this is a faithful representation of Akhenaten, that it's something that actually depicts how he looked rather than something that is shaped by his religious ideas or some conscious effort to deviate from the standards of Egyptian art up until that point. I think you need proof to suggest if, you know, there, there is something about him that actually means this is a faithful and literal representation. That is my opinion. You are, you're free, of course, to dissent. And I'd actually be interested if uh, anybody has any thoughts on that uh, when we get to the Zoom session about this. A little bit more about his uh, revolution. So by the sixth year of his reign, he is calling himself Akhenaten rather than Amenhotep. It's a very complex name. It's got interesting connotations about transfiguration and personal union with the god. Uh, remember, when you are transfigured, you become Ak. Now, he's removing a moon at this point from temples and tombs. Even the first half of his father's name is removed from inscriptions. And the Aten is increasingly depicted at this point as an aniconic god, uh, a sun visible in the sky, and the queen and the king are the divine intermediaries. So palace architecture is changed to highlight this. It's interesting to note, however, that the Egyptians are actually, this is not new to them. They are not, the idea of monotheism is not foreign. Uh, references to God or the God, not uncommon in Egyptian writing. The concept that there could be a single divine principle behind the gods they worshipped is something that we see cropping up from time to time. Now, that being said, you can believe in a single divine principle while still worshipping traditional gods as long as you're not exclusive. Uh, Akhenaten's religion, Atenism, was exclusive. It was aggressively so. It doesn't just negate other gods. It avoids personalizing the one god. Aten is more of a cosmic power that manifests in the form of the sun. Aten can't be jealous. Aten can't demand loyalty. It's all about universal cosmic truth and the structure of the universe. So yeah, this is, this is a strange religion by the standard of the day. You might say he was ahead of his time. But the simplicity of it was probably due to its short lifespan. If it had survived, it would have been elaborated upon. It would have developed further, probably in ways that Akhenaten himself would not have liked. Religion always tends to make itself more complex. So remember that what we know about Atenism is about a religion in its initial stages. And certainly there is proof enough from Amarna itself that not even all of its inhabitants were into the new religion. There are traditional images of the gods in some of the houses. And certainly at the end of Akhenaten's reign, traditional worship picked right back up. So just to, to close off, a few, few things about Akhenaten's later years and his legacy. Towards the end of his life, he gets a co-pharaoh. And I'm going to try and pronounce this. I practice every time I give this lecture, but I always screw it up. Nefern Pharaoh Aten Ankeperere, beloved of the Aten. There are theories that this is in fact Nefertiti under another name, but the evidence is all circumstantial. 
Now, another possibility for this new co-pharaoh is actually the eldest daughter, Mare Totten. She seems to have become her father's consort sometime late in his reign. Uh, incest is not uncommon amongst Egyptian royalty, although generally it's brother's sister. Now, he seems to have died in the 17th year of his reign. Uh, how do we tell? Uh, jar labels are last evidence for him. Uh, there is a honey jar where someone tried to date it to year 17 of Akhenaten's reign, but then scratched it out and dated it to year one of his successor's reign. We do not know where he's buried. We have pieces of his funeral equipment, and some have speculated that this uh, mummy that was found in the Valley of the Kings with a mutilated face uh, that was found with funerary objects that are associated with his mother and one of his wives may have been Akhenaten himself. But it doesn't have any physical abnormalities that we can tell. Uh, we think his co-pharaoh ruled for about three years, but the new religion died and a nefer and a pharaoh tried to improve things with the religious establishment in Thebes. Now, they were followed by a Smenkari Anka Parare, who also may have been a renamed Nefertiti or a husband of one of the daughters. Uh, there's one suggestion that he was uh, the husband of Meritotten, which might make sense. Or perhaps that these were factions that were active at the same time. Now, there's been a confusion in Egyptology for a long time over whether these two pharaohs, Nefer and Neferuaten, and Smenkare, were even separate people. It's all based on such fragmentary evidence, even by Egyptian standards, and things don't clarify until we get to Tutankhamun's uh, reign. Now, he's rather better known for obvious reasons. He returned to the traditional forms of worship, even reverted his name back, and by the second year of his reign, he's back in Thebes. Now, Tutankhamun is confirmed by DNA testing to be the son of the mummy we think is Akhen Akhenaten, and another mummy that's sort of been dubbed the younger lady, who might be Nefertiti, might be Meritotten, might be one of several other royal women of that generation. It's hard to tell. Now, efforts begin almost immediately to remove Akhenaten from the historical record. He is blamed for the upheaval in Egypt. So by the time you reach a century past his death, his name is off all the king lists, his inscriptions are scratched out, the buildings are torn down. There is only one mention of him from the reign of Ramses II. He's called that fallen foe from Amarna and a Kheru, or a criminal. Now, one of his great works, the great hymn to the sun, uh, disappears between 1340 BCE, but is rediscovered in 1884 in the, one of the tombs associated with his family and is presented by an Egyptologist to the public. Now, his story is preserved only because of chronicles and temple annals, and in the third century BCE, Greek historians picked it up and brought it into the classical tradition. You see vague references in the works of Manetho, who's an Egyptian historian from the third century. Uh, he preserved uh, a story from the historian Josephus about a, uh, a priest who ruled over Egypt for 13 years in league with the Hyksos, who had destroyed the temples and the statutes of the gods. And apparently he led lepers, which is interesting. Uh, so the idea that religious conflict was a sickness which reflects some of the attitudes we think existed towards Akhenaten's revolution. We do see similar thoughts along those lines on Tutankhamun's restoration stele, talking about why he went back to the traditional form of worship, because you are recovered, you are well again. Now we are going to worship the real gods. And just to close things out, so how do we evaluate Akhenaten? We do have some other sources that talk about his reign. There's a letter from the king of Assyria talking about how Akhenaten made his envoy stand in the sun all day, which is kind of funny. You've got the restoration decree uh, from Tut's reign, uh, the coronation edict from Hormheb's reign, which is slightly later. They talk about all of the damage that had been done, so temples that have been closed, uh, consequences for the economy, a political collapse on the foreign front. Now, did Atonism actually unsettle society to that extent, or is this just exaggeration? 
Now, when you look at modern thinkers talking about Akhenaten, there's uh, a number of different interpretations of him. Some think that he was saintly, that he basically invented a monotheistic god way before its time. Others say, well, no, he's more of a fanatic, possibly also a genius, but uh, geniuses are often very odd, too. There is no claim that he ever committed any massacres or atrocities, at least no claims that have survived. Uh, in a way, you have to see him in the context of his age. You know, Egypt at this time is very cosmopolitan, and it's struggling with how to govern its foreign possessions. So any attempt to create a universal or simplified religion might have been an attempt to unify Egypt and its possessions uh, outside of Egypt itself. Imperialism is hard in the pre-modern world. Now, one author I've read has an interesting theory about Amarna. He calls it uh, a traumatic experience, the Amarna period. The memory is not wiped out, but it's consciously repressed. It's encrypted, where Amarna is the crypt and can't be accessed by the collective memory. I mean, as to what was so traumatic, think about what we discussed regarding the highly structured and ritual aspects of Egyptian belief. We looked at the context of death, but the same is true about the regular festivals and the rituals that are celebrated on an everyday level. If all of that stops, it's sort of like a moral blow to Egyptian collective psychology. So that might be why the reaction to Akhenaten was as violent as it was. All right, I hope you found that interesting. He is a fascinating figure. And uh, I look forward to your thoughts on the Amarna letters when we get there in the Zoom session. All right, thanks very much, guys.